I got this really cool clock. And then I got my clock cleaned. Hey, Jim. After church, remind me to tell you the Noel joke. Because I told it to the church last week and you weren't in here and they booed. <laughs> anyway, so I'm not saying it again even though I should. Today we're going to talk about the birth celebration because the world needs to understand that this is a party. You know, people are talking about negative stuff about the holidays. And the thing is, is that as people, the majority of us, we like to party. We like to party. We're Baptists. So we like food at parties. You came in here last night and there was a tremendous amount of food. And nobody's shy about filling their plates. And in the old days, we were known for potlucks. And people would come in and there would be all kinds of food. Tony Evans once said that he knew that the official food of heaven was fried chicken. Because of all the fried chicken that he'd ate in his life at church parties. And we like to party, and we love birthday parties. I'm getting ready to come up to my 60th birthday, and one of the things the kids are talking about is doing a party for me with some of the family at a place called Top Golf. And they're going to rent one of them stalls for a couple hours, and we're going to hit golf balls and, then, and have food, and it just sounds like so much fun. And we love the holidays. We do. We like the 4th of July, the picnics, Memorial Day pick out, cookouts. We have Labor Day cookouts, Thanksgiving. Okay, how many dinners did you eat this year for Thanksgiving? I went into the sugar doctor and he talked about my sugar being high. And I'm looking at him like, don't be ridiculous. What kind of dummy brings me in here the week after Thanksgiving and gets mad that my sugar's high? You know? If you want me in here, you got to look at the proper holidays. You know, you need to give me a couple weeks after Halloween because you know that people are going to bring me baby Ruth bars. And, and then, you know, you got to get me right in there between Halloween and Thanksgiving. And he says, but we want an accurate depiction. He wants an accurate depiction. I don't. <laughs> I want to know that I'm really healthy and fine. But we like eating and being with friends and having a good time. We love having celebrations. But here's the thing. When Christmas comes, we can get kind of grouchy about stuff. You know, you can run into people in the mall. And they're real grouchy from all the lines they've been in. And they're real grouchy to waiters and waitresses. It's really funny to talk about waiters and waitresses. Did you know 20 years ago, tips went up? through December, and waitresses were real happy because they made so much money that time of year. And do you know that tips are descending in December? Because, excuse me, people are using all their money at stores, and then they're grouchy, and if the waiter or waitress does any little thing wrong, they're ready to pounce because they're mad. They're aggravated. They're tough about it. They're mad about how much things cost how much time they're having to spend. And then they look at their calendars, and their calendars are just booked crazy. i got to be here this night, here this night, here this night, here this night. And things at work are going crazy, and all this stuff's happening. But here's the thing. How do we celebrate Jesus? Because in the midst of finding out that people are mad about the holiday, and they're mad about their calendar, and they're mad about this, None of it is surrounding Jesus. None of the, the parties and the festivities are about how happy we are that Jesus is here. How happy we are that we're going to live forever. How happy that God made the ultimate sacrifice by sending His one and only Son to die for each and every one of us. And that's what the whole holiday is about. That's why it's called Christmas. Now, we get mad because people don't say Merry Christmas anymore, and they say Happy Holidays. And I've told you before in years past because I've gotten in trouble about it in my office, and I love when I'm in trouble. 
And I think that some Christians should jump into the happy holiday because they really don't celebrate Christmas. They don't celebrate Christ. They don't stop to think about Jesus and what he did for them, because if they did, you would notice a little glide in your step. You would notice a little happiness. You walk in a hospital where people are dying, and you know that everybody in there is not going to die, and that you're never going to die, because you're going to live forever. And you go to a funeral. I went to a funeral last Tuesday. It was pure celebration. Very few tears cried. Because everything was joy because they knew that the lady, that her body was in that coffin, that that lady had already been in the presence of Jesus Christ and was enjoying her eternity already. And the main thought was as much as she loved Christmas, can you imagine what it's like in heaven? That's a great thought, isn't it? How does Jesus celebrate a birthday celebrated in heaven? The day that started all the ability for everybody to come to heaven. The day that Jesus took human form and came to earth is the day that triggered everything so that all those people, all those souls that are in heaven with God, waiting for us to join them, waiting for future people to join them, all of that was triggered on a morning in Bethlehem. When a young girl gave birth to a baby who would be the savior to the entire world. Boy, doesn't that get you rolling? Doesn't that get you going? Doesn't that get your heart beating? Doesn't that get you excited? Doesn't that make you want to sing How Great Is Our God Again? Can we get the band back up here? Maybe sing it with a little more vigor? A little more excitement? How great is our God? We're saved because Jesus came to earth. We're saved because a baby came in a manger. And, and, and we have a holiday that celebrates that. And we know that for a fact because of the last four minutes of a Charlie Brown Christmas. <laughs> right? It's not in Rudolph, it's not in Elf, but it's in a Charlie Brown Christmas. So we have to make a decision on our celebration. Is he what Christmas is about? As I come into Christmas, as I come to a week and a half away from Christmas Day, is it about Jesus? Is that what's in my mind? Is that what's in my heart? Or am I letting the world come in and try to take over? And before we do, let's give the Lord a prayer. God, we come to you today just so thankful for Christmas and what it means to us. And Lord, I ask that you would be with us today as we study your word and, and help us to learn to celebrate, to let people see the special light in it, the special light in our heart, because we're so excited to celebrate what you did for us. And Lord, we just ask that you would uh, help us today to learn more about you and more about celebrating and, and to be truly excited and, and to share this news with others who don't know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to start off talking today about the angels. And angels are a creature that is created to serve God and man. There's a mistaken thing that started somewhere that when we die, we become angels. And it is simply not true. If you believe that, I'm sorry to step on your toes, but it's not right. Angels are, P are, are creatures that are made solely to serve God and men. Okay? They're quite beautiful. They're quite wonderful. God uses them. They all have all kinds of different jobs. But one thing they have in common is angels love a good celebration. Angels love a great party. And they love to be joyful. What? How do we know this? Well, the scriptures tell us things. We know about how, how it is at Christmas. We know how the party's going to be when all the church comes to heaven at, at the rapture. But one of the things that I love is, did you realize that every time somebody gives their life to Christ, there's a huge parade in heaven? 
And they say that the angels walk down the streets with banners with your name on them. That they're so happy that you're coming home. It tells us that in God's Word. And, and, and we know that they love to party. We know they love to celebrate. And you know why they do? They love God. It makes me think of your birthday party. You know, when, when it was my mom and dad's birthday, I loved doing all kinds of things for them and making a super special day for them because of how much I love them. Oh yeah? Did you do that? For your family? For your kids? When it's my kid's birthday, I try to see that they have an unreal day. Just a perfect day with everything they might want or desire for a day because I love them. I want them to have a special day. I want them to know that there's no doubt how much dad loves me. And so when angels have a holiday for God, when there's a celebration for God, they just go nuts because they want God to know that there's no doubt how much they love God. And angels get very little time on earth except for the angels that are here to protect us or to take care of certain things. And so we read the, the, the Christmas story in Luke 2, and in verse 8 through 13 it says, That night in the fields near Bethlehem some shepherds were guarding the sheep. All at once an angel came down to them from the Lord, and the brightness of the Lord's glory flashed around them. The shepherds were frightened, but the angel said, Don't be afraid, I have good news for you, which will make everyone happy. This very day, in King David's hometown, a Savior was born for you. He is Christ the Lord. You know who He is, because you will find Him dressed in baby clothes, lying on a bed of hay. Suddenly, many other angels came down from heaven and joined in praising God. They said, Praise God in heaven, praise on earth to everyone who pleases God. So the angels come down, and, and the first thing they say is, Don't be afraid. Okay, I would like to put a big neon Christmas message in each one of your windows. Don't be afraid. Does the news scare you to death every day? Everything that you watch on TV? Scare you. Don't be afraid. God is in charge. You talk about peace on earth? You want peace in your heart? Know that God is is in charge. Oh yeah? Oh yes. Yeah. I thought as soon as I said that I'd hear a lot more oh yes. Thank you, Randy. God is in charge. God is in charge. Don't be afraid. The world's going to throw all kinds of garbage at you to make you run every day, to make you unhappy. Jesus says don't lose your joy. Don't let the devil rob your joy. Don't be afraid. God is in charge. God is in control. But can we relax? Can we sit back and realize that God's in control? You know, when you got a really tough situation, what would happen in the world if 100% of people, when they had a really tough situation, prayed? You think that would make a difference? And prayed about other situations? Prayed about what's going on in the country? Pray about what's going on in people's family. Pray about people you know. Pray about people you don't know. What happens if we pray? It makes huge differences. He said he brought good news that makes everyone happy. Now, as a pastor, I have to put a little footnote on this. I understand clinical depression. And this message is not for people who suffer from clinical depression. It's a whole different piece. But people who just get sad for stupid reasons in the holidays, we have a message that makes everyone happy. The Savior has come. And here's the thing. You know more than the angels did. The Savior has died and has risen again. Oh, yeah? Yeah, does that make you happy? Does that change your step? Does that change how a nasty news story on TV can make you feel? Does that change how much a cashier that screws up at the register can bother you? It changes everything, doesn't it? Because you know what? This stuff is temporary. I'm taken care of in the things eternal. That's what I care about. I don't worry so much about the temporary stuff. The world can change in a heartbeat. I was with a lady the other day that came in on Tuesday. 
not feeling good in her stomach, and on Wednesday found out she had less than four months to live at 54 years old. Bam! Overnight. Had a stomach ache. Stomach ache, I'm not going to live through the year. But you know what? When you know Jesus, it's just a stepping stone, isn't it? I'm just on my way to be with Him. Death has been conquered. It's gone. Good news that makes everyone happy. And does that good news change you? Does it make you different? And the angels were praising God, and does it make you praise God? How's your praising? How's your praising? You know, and, and it's, it's kind of funny. There's all kinds of praise of God. There's all kinds of things we can do in worship. But one of the things is, is that uh, churches are finding more and more people are coming to church after music is over. And, and people don't enjoy singing. There's all kinds of fight about music and everything. And one of the things I like to do is go up to people who don't come until music's over and say, well, how did you praise God this week? What were the words you used to praise God? Mm -hmm. I hate that preacher. Wish so we could get rid of him. Yeah, it's all kinds of jerky stuff. How's your praise? If you only like the hymns, how many hymns did you sing this week? Because the words. If you only like the praise songs, how many praise songs did you sing this week? How much time in your prayer time, instead of asking if the heal Aunt Beth or Uncle Phil, how much of your prayer time is concentrated on you are such an awesome God. I can't believe what you've done for me. I can't believe. Praise God. Head of heaven. Head of the universe. Head of everything. Father of my blessed son, Jesus. How many times have you praised God? Tell him just how incredible he is. Not thanking him. Just tell him how awesome he is. How much time. The angels love to do that. And boy, this is the time of year that brings us out to want to praise God. That's the angels. And then we get to the shepherds. The shepherds were dudes that were really down on their luck. And you know they were down on their luck because they were shepherds. There were two kinds of shepherds. There were shepherds that owned the sheep. And they were pretty wealthy businessmen, in which you can look at David's father. If you study King David, and his father was a pretty wealthy man that owned a lot of sheep. And David is a member of the family that took care of sheep. And then there was the Rena shepherds, which were the... The, the guys that we're talking about here. They were the lowest ranks of society. They would even steal the, the sheep owner's sheep and kill them and eat them. And if a lion or a bear came, you remember David killing lions and bears to protect the sheep? These guys just ran and hid. And they didn't do it because they just wanted to stay alive. And they needed some money and they couldn't do anything else, so they did that. And, and I love it because these guys that are down in their life, that's who God decides to tell first. Isn't that awesome? His first announcement is to the guys that at that time didn't even make minimum wage. They, they had no place to go. They didn't have families. And Luke 2, 15 through 20 says, After the angels had left and going back to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem and see what the Lord has told us about. They hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and saw the baby lying on a bed of hay. When the shepherds saw Jesus, they told his parents what the angel had said about him. And everyone listened and was surprised. But Mary kept thinking about this all and wondering what it meant. All the shepherds returned to their sheep and they were praising God, saying wonderful things about him. Everything they had seen and heard was just as the angel had said. They took the news and they searched. I love that because when we take the Christmas story and the Christmas news, do we search into it? I saw a wonderful sermon the other day from Andy Stanley. And he went through and he, he showed that when you look at the Luke 2 Christmas story, that it was an exact answer to all the promises God made to Abraham. And I thought, this is just fantastic. This is just incredible because this is, this is just like when I'm writing the sermon about the separate searching. This is somebody who's went to search about all the things that happened for Christmas and realized and looked and said, hey, you know, God made all these promises to Abraham. And they were finally fulfilled on the day when a baby came and was born in the manger. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that awesome? You see, you've got to search to look for stuff like that. You've got to search to find out what Jesus did for you. So 
So they took it and they searched. And then, and then when they found everything was true, they went and worshipped. They went and worshipped God for all that He'd done. I mean, you think about it. You see angels. And they're singing praise to me. And they go and they see this baby. And everything they find is true. And so they go and they worship God. And the question is, is do you think this experience changed their lives? That's a tough one, isn't it? It's a tough thing to wonder. We don't, we don't have any historical evidence. We don't have any documentations in the scripture. We don't, we don't know for a fact that it changed these guys' lives. We don't know that they started going into town and, and preaching to people and telling everybody what they saw. We really don't know that. We just assume. But yet, we look at the church. And we look at the church, and the church has people who come and, and they find Jesus. And they find that it's true. And, and they come up and they pray. And then in a week or so, they get the baptismal. And, and they're, they're, oh, they're ducked under the water. And they come out and they're a new creation in Christ. And, and here's the thing. There's a change. Are they different people? Because we can be very critical of the shepherds. That we don't have any history of it changed them. We can think about the ten lepers, right? That only one out of ten lepers come back and thank Jesus for what he did. What are we like? What happened to us when we found the baby? When we found the man who died on the cross? When we found the man that rose from the dead? And we accepted that in our lives. And, and we said, we're going to give you our life. And we're going to change and be what you want us to be. How did that change us? What did we become for him? And in the Christmas season, how different are we? You know, do you ever wonder... I know, you know, today somebody looked at me and I think they were surprised how quick I threw a date back. They said, when was Jesus actually born? I said, April 17th. And, and I'll tell you, Luke is so proud of that. About 20 years, Luke was born on April 17th. So about 20 years ago, these scientists all got together and they studied these things in the stars and they said that the star of Bethlehem was at its highest point over Bethlehem on April 17th. And they believe that historically and everything based on when it uh, Herod had the, all the people in Bethlehem killed and everything. They, they really believed that he was born on April 17th. And Luke was just so proud that Jesus and he shared the birthday. But, you know, the thing of it was, is if it was April 17th, what did the shepherds do the next year on April 17th? Where were they? What were they doing? See, they would heard angels from the sky. The sky lit up. The angels are glowing. They're floating in the air singing. What would you do if you saw an angel float in the air singing? An angel comes down and talks to you. And you're surrounded by the glory of the Lord. And tells you that this baby is born and it's the promise of God. Where are you a year later? And yet, people come. They pray. Jesus fills them with the Holy Spirit because they asked for it. Jesus forgives them of every sin they've ever committed. Jesus tells them that the rest of their days they will He will represent them to God and be their mediator and be their high priest and make sure everything is okay for when they're in the presence of God and where are they a year later? What are they doing? What are they saying about Jesus? What are they doing about Jesus? How much are they serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? And you have us. How do we praise? This Christmas, how are we praising God? What are we doing? What makes us stand out from the crowd? I saw today that uh, a new article came out that four out of ten millennials are totally making the decision to walk away from religion in the United States of America. And went through a list of reasons why. And most of it was the same reasons that it's always been. The people who claim to be Christians are unbelievable in their faith. They're no different than I am. Now, we're not supposed to be totally different. 
because we're just humans. And that's why Jesus died for us. But shouldn't they see some difference in us? Shouldn't they see a celebration? Are we happy? Do we walk around with long faces all the time? Are we riding with the rest of the world talking about how terrible the holiday is? Or are we right there saying, hey, you know what? It can be tough, but it's all about Jesus, so I'm going to make it work. Do we look at people when they're down and say, hey, I sure love you. And, and just remember, it's all about Jesus. That's what it is. Don't let the world get you off on the stupid stuff. It's all about Jesus. Do we seek Him? Do we look for Him as we get through the holiday? Where is our heart in Christmas? 1 Thessalonians 5, 16-18 says, Always be joyful and never stop praying. Whatever happens, keep thanking God because of Jesus Christ. This is what God wants you to do. Here's your party orders. Always be joyful. I love my children with all my heart, and they love me, except at 6.30 in the morning. When the alarm goes off, you know that happy idiot that you see all the time running around smiling and laughing and having a good time? That's how I wake up in the morning. No need for coffee, no need for anything. My children hate me. I think that everybody that works on my floor at the hospital hates me. How can you be like this in the morning? Aren't we supposed to be like that all the time? Always be joyful. There's a difference in our step. Has Jesus made a difference in you? The thing that we fear most is, is death. He eliminated it. It's gone. You don't have to worry. You never have to worry about death. Gone. Finished. Over. Done. Why? Well, took away that. What can take away my joy? Don't let anything rob your joy. That's what Jesus said. Don't let the devil rob your joy. Stay joyful. Never stop praying. You know, one of the things is, is never stop praying. People think that's about their needs, but how often do you stop and tell God you love something? Have you ever been to the Festival of Lights at the zoo? I haven't been for three or four years. What a time to pray. Aren't the lights beautiful? Among rhinoceroses and elephants and lions and tigers. If you can't find something to thank God for when you're walking through that festival of lights, you need to reestablish your, your relationship. Because it's just incredible, not to mention all the beautiful babies in the strollers that are trying to see out of a hole that big between 13 blankets. We've got to keep it. You know? You see, never stop praying. Thanking God. Pizza. I thank God for pizza so much. <laughs> when I get to heaven, I, I know he's just going to have pizza around me everywhere. Keep thanking God. What a picture of the church. Always being joyful. Never stop praying. And keep thanking God. What a picture of the church. If the church was like that, do you think four out of ten millennials would walk away from religion? Wouldn't churches be packed on Sunday mornings? Wouldn't it be an exciting place to be, a place that's full of love for other people? Because you know what? God is love, and if we love God, we're going to love everybody around us. Oh yeah? yeah. And so just a total filled place of love? But is this what we're doing? Is this where the church is? Is this how we've responded to what God has called us to do? Is this what we've called? Because it says in the Bible, just what we read in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16-18, this is what God wants you to do. Would you like to be found lacking of not doing what God wants you to do? These people have lists of the Ten Commandments. And they're scared to death to break any of the commandments. And they're, they're fearful for that. And let me tell you something right now. You cannot not break the Ten Commandments. You're going to break them. You can, walk, you can break one watching TV. I wish I had that. I wish I had that. Oh, my neighbor got that. I kind of hate him. We can, we can get upset about that. 
We can have horrible thoughts. We can have horrible thoughts about people yesterday. I heard Buckeyes fans talking about Joe Burrows yesterday and all the stuff they wanted to happen to him so he didn't win the high school. It's, it's a stupid football award. And you've got malice in your heart and, and hate this kid that went somewhere where he had an opportunity.